great is our God. Amen. How many of y'all is great today? How many of y'all would agree that God is great today? How many of y'all would agree that God is mighty today? How many of y'all agree that God is worthy today? Come on, y'all. I'm talking about Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the Lord. How many of y'all know he's worthy today? God is worthy today. He's worthy today. So, Lord, we celebrate you, oh God, because, God, you are worthy on today, God. We lift your name on high today, God, because you are King of kings and you are Lord of lords, God. We lift your name on high, God, because, Lord, you are our champion, God. We lift your name on high, God, because you sent your son to die for our sins, oh God. God, we bless your name today, God, because you indwell us with your Holy Spirit, God, your presence, oh God. So, God, we come today, God, as a reminder of how worthy you are, God. In spite of our unworthiness, God, you are worthy, oh God, so we exalt you, Father. And the fact that, God, we get to be here, God, to lift your name, God, ought to be enough, God, to compel us and persuade us, God, to passionately, God, worship you, God, to passionately, God, lift up your name, oh Lord. So, God, I was online today, God, and... This is an exciting time in March, God. It's the selection show will be this evening, God, for the top teams, God, in the NCAA, God. And, God, they're going to be teams all across the country, God, waiting to hear their names called, Father. It's going to be fans, God, waiting to hear their names called, God. And, well, people are going to be so excited, God, and so exuberant, God, and, God, so affixed, God, this announcement, God. But, Lord, that announcement, God, pales into comparison, God to the announcement that, Lord, when you come back, God, you're going to come back in the air, God. According to 1st John chapter 4, God, you're going to come back in the air, Lord. And so, Lord, it pales in comparison, God, to that announcement, Lord. So I want to pray, God, that we will be faithful announcers of the good news of Jesus Christ. And that, God, our greatest excitement, our greatest exuberance, our greatest endeavor, God, would be, God, to be engaged with your kingdom, Lord. So, God, we're thankful people. We ask, God, that you would speak to us today, God. We pray, God, that you would speak through me, God, to encourage your people. It's in Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen? Amen. Let's give our great God a round of applause. Amen. I don't know about y'all, but I'm excited about Jesus today. Amen? This time of year, I used to get very excited about basketball because back in 19, what was it? Woo! Uh, <laughs> 89 and 1990, we were preparing to go and play in the NCAA and all that kind of stuff. And you get excited for a week when you get sent home in the first round. <laughs> and so you go from the mountaintop to the valley real fast, all righty. But hey, we got to the mountaintop though, right? Hey, amen, right? I would get so excited about that. I'd be so exuberant. And when you go and play D1 basketball, your entire season is predicated and built around this particular time of the year. Success was dictated by how well did you do in your regular season and did you qualify to be one of the, at the time, was one of the top 64 teams in the country. Well, we got so excited about that. We got so enthused about that. And so basically, our vision was not just to put a team on the court. Our vision was not just to win our conference championship. Our vision wasn't even just to make it to the NCAA. Our sights were set on, can we win this entire thing? And the reality is most of us knew in advance we were not going to win at all. Somebody <laughs> but it didn't stop us from dreaming. It didn't stop us from, from, from anticipating. It didn't stop us from preparing to get there and to do all that we can do. I want to talk for the next two weeks about thinking big. <laughs> um, ooh, ooh. Can you all tell me? Thinking big. You know, when it comes to thinking big, many of us don't think big at all. It's the anomaly. It's the exception to think big. Most of us, about what can I accomplish in my own strength? What can I accomplish with my own network? What can I accomplish based upon what I can see and by, um, based upon what I can do? But most of us really don't think big. That's why when you see podcasts, when I talk about think big, people get excited about a podcast about thinking big. So that's why when articles come out about thinking big, people say, well, let me read that article about th um, th um, thinking big because most of us don't think big. 
when we hear sermons about thinking big, blah, 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 that's great. I, I want to think big. And most of all, when it comes to thinking big, we think about a big job, a big bank account, a big house. We don't think about big families. That's only the Womacks. We don't think about big families. All right, all right. We don't think about big families. But because, because, because big families mean big expenses, right? Watch this now. But let me ask you a question. How come we don't think about making a big impact for God? We think about thinking big. Most of the time, we don't think about Christianity. We don't think about our spiritual gifts. We don't think about um, the Holy Spirit being big in our lives. We don't think about how God wants to use us. We don't think about our generational impact upon humanity. We don't think big about what God wants to do through us as believers in Jesus Christ. And so we think about that passage, now unto him who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond, da, 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 all we watch this now, we don't apply that to what we can do in Christ. We typically think about what can God do for me, myself, and mine. So I want to twist this phrase today, and I want, to, I, want to, I want to apply it towards thinking big for the kingdom of God. How many of us spend time thinking about what can God do through me for his glory? What can God do through me in my lifetime? What can God do through me to, to put a dent in darkness? What can God do through me to elevate and exalt and expand his kingdom? Amen? If you all will, turn your attention to Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, it's an interesting book. You've got the Gospels. You've got the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Then you have the um, Luke of uh, the Luke. Then you have the Gospel of John, which is distinct from the other Gospel, but it's a, it's a Gospel nonetheless. Then what you have, you have the book of Acts, which is now this transitional book. And so when you read the book of Acts, Acts is not just merely a, um, um, a book in the Bible. It's a transitional book. And we get hung up in the book of Acts because we don't understand the nature of the book of Acts. The nature of the book of Acts, Acts is a transitional book moving from a time where now the Holy Spirit is present and now the Holy Spirit is on the scene. Now the church has been birthed and what God promised in the Old Testament is now coming to fruition in the New Testament. It's a transitional book. We go from living by the law to now living by grace. And so what happens is people try making normative what is not normative in the book of Acts. So Acts is a transitional book. Acts is also a transformational book. And Acts is not merely about what humans did, but Acts is about what the Holy Spirit does in the lives of people who submit to the person of the Holy Spirit. When we come to the book of Acts, we often think that the Holy Spirit is a thing. The Holy Spirit is not a thing. The Holy Spirit is not a power. The Holy Spirit is a person. Are we tracking together? And so now we have a relationship with this person, and this person wants us to think big. In Acts chapter 1, when you come um, 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 to the book of Acts, the outline can be broken down from chapters 1 and 2, chapters 3 through 8, and then chapters 9 through 28 in the book of Acts. In chapters 1 through 3, he talks about the power of the church. It was the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and, and unfilled believers' lives and what transpired on the day of Pentecost, chapters 1 and 2. In chapters 3 through 8, he talks about the progress of the church. And you see how they were witnesses, um, Paul and Peter, they were witnesses unto the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they lived their lives centered around living for Christ. Then chapters 8, I'm sorry, I'm chapters 9 through 28, you see the proclamation of the church. And God is proclaiming who he is, and now we're trying to get to the ends of the earth with the gospel. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, if y'all can read that with me. Y'all good? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem um, and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That becomes the entire outline for the entire book of Acts um, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the world. You can break the book of Acts down geographically by Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. So when you come to the book of Acts, you see that he is focused on the gospel. Amen? 
In verse 3, I'm sorry, verse 1 says, in, this, in, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. And so now Luke is the author of the book of Acts. He's talking about um, what he has covered in this book. He says here, he says, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Then he takes, he says, to them he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Can y'all say kingdom? In other words, he begins his conversation about the kingdom of God. He makes a presentation. And first, you know what? Here is my presentation where Christ was presented alive. The second thing he gives is a proof. Verse 4 says, and while staying um, with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So now what he comes and says, you know what, is that there is going to be um, 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 the, 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 the promise of the Holy Spirit. He's going to come, and now he's going to indwell believers. You also have a, um, a um, reference back to, to, to Joel, where he makes reference to the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit coming. Amen? So first thing you see is a presentation. The second thing you see is a proof. He says in verse 3, to them he presented himself alive by suffering, by his suffering, by many proofs, appearing to them. So watch this now. When Christ was crucified, the last thing we read in the Gospels that Christ was crucified and then Christ was resurrected, this is between the resurrection and the ascension. Are we tracking together? So, boy, the resurrection is to be raised from the grave. The ascension is to go from um, 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 earth up into heaven. But before he went from earth after the resurrection, but before he went back to heaven is what now we call this interim period. He makes these appearances to show that he was alive. The reason that we are celebrating Easter is because he's alive. The reason we're celebrating Easter is because he is alive. Are we tracking together? And boy, you know what? Don't get it twisted. In the midst of all of the commercialism, in the midst of all the um, um, uh, um, 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 all the egg chasing, in the midst of all the celebration, and boy, in the midst of all the parties, don't miss the reason for the season. It's the resur It's the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, but why should we go and celebrate, and why should we go and proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ because of the proof that He was alive? And so now, um, 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 in Corinthians, it talks about these proofs of him being alive. The third thing you see is a promise. And while, and, and, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, but John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And the Holy Spirit was projected as the promise. Then you see a proclamation. Look at verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And so watch this now. It was to the Jew first. So when you thought about kingdom, you thought about Christ, you initially thought about the Jews. But then Romans teaches us that, boy, he went to the Jews first, then to the Gentiles. So it wasn't just for the Jews. So they're asking the logical question, are you about to restore the kingdom to Israel? Verse 7, he said to them, it is not, you know, kind of mind your own business. Verse 7, he said to them, it is not, you know, the times of seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. So he makes a proclamation. Part one of the proclamation is that you will receive the Holy Spirit. The second part of the proclamation is that you all will be witnesses unto me. Then you see his presence. When the Holy Spirit comes, his Holy Spirit takes up residence in the inside of believers' lives. Amen? Now watch this now. Let me show you all something. Here in verse, he said, but you will receive power. We read that verse and we say, okay, well, but the Holy Spirit must be a power. He, watch this now. The Holy Spirit is a person. He says this, it, it says when, when, 
But, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit, not a Holy Spirit, not a power. He says, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Don't confuse the power for the person of the Holy Spirit. Are we tracking together? Now, boy, the Holy Spirit is powerful, but the Holy Spirit is just not merely some, 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 some generic power. Holy Spirit is a person. And he says, guys, Holy Spirit wants to have a relationship with you. And when Holy Spirit comes and indwells your lives as believers in Jesus Christ, then the outcome will be that you will be witnesses for me. Are we still together? So we see, um, we, see, we see a presentation, we see a proof, we see a promise, we see a proclamation, we see his presence. But watch this now, you also ought to see a progression. The progression is in verse 8. He says, and when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. This is where those maps in the back of your Bible come in handy. I know y'all ain't never used them. You say, Pastor, I, I, I wonder why that was back there. You know, I mean, I, I wonder why I even needed maps when I got GPS, right? But well, this is to give you the, um, the, 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 the biblical locations. And so what you begin to see is Jerusalem was here. Judea was further out. Um, Samaria was even further out. All to the uttermost parts of the world, you see a progression where God wants to see the gospel expand throughout all the world. Are we tracking together? Now, boy, this sounds foreign to us because we get so worried about our personal address that we don't address the addresses that God wants to address. We don't want to address the Samaria. We don't want to address the Judea. We don't want to address the uttermost parts of the world. Why? We become so concerned about our addresses, the place where we live, the place where we work, the place where we shop, the place where we recreate, but we're not really concerned about zip codes way out there. Smile at me. God wants to know, are you thinking bigger? Are you thinking beyond the zip codes that you know? Are you thinking beyond the area codes that you are comfortable with? So Jerusalem was the immediate. That was ground zero. That's where all the Jews hung out. That's where they were familiar with who Christ was. That's where they knew people who were familiar, people who were just like them. Then they began to spread and boy, Judea. They were familiar, but a little less Samaria, um, um, familiar. Samaria was what they called the half-breed. That's where when the Assyrians had came and um, took um, 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 Jerusalem captive and where they began to cohabitate, they came up with a race called the Samaritans. And but they were not smiled upon. They were critiqued. They were criticized. They were called half-breeds. And then he says, to the uttermost parts of the world. You read in the book of Romans where Paul, his goal was to get the gospel to Rome. At that time, that was the furthest place they knew about. So he said, watch this now. I want to see the gospel progress. I want to see the gospel spread. I want to see the gospel hit people who are unfamiliar. I want to see the gospel impact people who you may not like. I want to see the gospel impact people who've got different values, a different culture, a different makeup. I want you all to think big about how will God use you to expand the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, we're going to ask you guys to go out there and share the gospel and invite people. And watch this now. Most of you all are going to go invite people who look just like you. Let me go and invite somebody who I know. Let me go and invite somebody who I think may receive me favorably. Let me go and invite somebody who I think I have more of a connection with. He says here, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you will be witnesses unto him in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Amen? So watch this now. The question becomes, are you going to think bigger? The challenge is, is that most of us orient our lives around our personal kingdom rather than around God's kingdom. In other words, watch this now. Lord, I don't have time to serve your kingdom because of my job. I don't have time to serve your kingdom because of my kids. I don't have time to serve your kingdom because of my exercise. I don't have time to serve. Oh, what do you mean you don't have time? 
Didn't you read Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Didn't you read his illustration about the big rocks, the sand, and, and, and the small rocks and pebbles? He said, well, how do you get the most into the jar? You put the big rocks in first. The only time you don't have time for the things of God is when you don't put God in first. You always have time for what is first. Are we tracking together? You always have time for what's the highest priority. But the challenge is we want to add God after we've added all our other stuff. So watch this now. Uh, we're about to hit this graduation season here pretty um, soon, but we got two graduating, one from high school and another one from college, and boy, we're excited, and boy, we're enthusiastic, and we're talking to our kids about graduation, and boy, we're, 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 we're very encouraged. But let me ask you a question. Do you put graduation academically in context of the kingdom? Do you put it in the context of how you live for God's glory? Do you put it in the context of, you know what, you exist for God's purposes. You exist for what God wants to do. You exist because God causes you to breathe. You exist because God gives you the ability to function. Are we tracking together? So my daughter, y'all know Taylor, some of y'all know Taylor, but she'd be graduating, and boy, we're excited for her, and boy, we're exuberant, and the question becomes, boy, what are the next steps, and what are you going to do? So I sent her a text this morning on the way, one of them voice to text that mess up everything you say, and so I sent, I sent her a voice to text, but the crux of the voice of the text was, sweetie, I want you to know that this next step you take ought to be predicated upon God's calling upon your life. The next step is not what are the options. The next step is not predicated upon what doors might open. The next step is not what can you do. The next step is predicated upon what is God calling you to do. And too many of us are not living our lives based upon the calling of God. We're living our lives based upon the American dream. We're living our lives based upon an income we're trying to pursue. We're living our lives based upon our own selfish ambitions. But do you orient your life around the kingdom of God? Let me ask you a question. Don't raise your hand. Don't say it out loud. Today is March 17th or whatever it is. How many hours have you spent this year thinking about how can you expand God's kingdom? How much time have you said, God, how can I rearrange my life to expand your kingdom? God, what do I need to adjust, God, so I can make a greater impact for your glory, God? Lord, what, God, what needs to be adjusted and moved around, God, so that I can be consistent with why you've placed me here on the earth, God? Lord, how do you want me to adjust my life to your kingdom and not try getting you to adjust to my kingdom? How much time have you spent this year thinking bigger for the kingdom? How much time have you spent saying, Lord, how do you want to use me and my gifts in the lives of somebody else? Lord, how can Lord, 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 how can I be a blessing to somebody because I woke up today for your glory and for your honor and for the expansion of your kingdom purposes, God? Lord, how do you want to use me today, Lord? How much time have we spent doing that? And the last thing we see here in my introduction, smile at me. Did I preach last week? I feel like I got to make up some time. I, I, I feel like I didn't preach last week. Somebody said, Pastor, you got done early. I was trying to use that time this week. <laughs> Smile at me. There's a privilege. There's a privilege. Can y'all say privilege? There's a privilege that God allows us to partner with him to help people headed towards a Christless eternity to make a U-turn and head towards heaven. I say, Pastor, why are you going to ask us to invite folks to church? And why are you going to ask us boy, to talk to folks about Christ? And ain't that your job? And, and boy, ain't that why we got social media? And boy, isn't that what you're supposed to be doing? And why we pay you, Pastor, to go out there and tell folks about Jesus? And, and Pastor, but that's your job. Watch this now. It's a privilege. Why would God allow such broken people to go and share the good news of Christ? Why would God allow us to be ambassadors for him? 
Why would God send us to be representatives of his eternal glory? What inherently is good enough to go and represent perfection? What inherently is good enough within us to go and represent him who has no flaw? How can we as corrupt people, as good as we are, we corrupt? Amen? Psalm 51 says, we jacked up. Smile at me, right? How in the world would God want to use somebody such as I to go and be a witness to his good news? So a college teammate of mine who um, was a minister when we were in college, and he, he sent me a text today, and he says, he says, well, if, if, if he's laughing at this morning, and he says, how do you become a pastor? And I reply back, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. And I said, you know what? No, seriously, there's a compelling indwelling that if you do otherwise, you have been disobedient to God. You want to know if God's calling you to something? A litmus test to know if it's God calling you to it. If you said no, would you be disobedient? See, when it's the calling of God and you say no, it's not optional. That's disobedience. Are we tracking together? And so then um, he sent me a text today about, you know, we passed, but we're getting all up in the news for all the wrong reasons today, right? And he said, well, let's talk tomorrow. And I'm going to tell him, you know what, don't confuse the messenger for the Lord. Don't confuse, just because the messenger messes up, don't mean that Christ is messed up. Just because his announcers get it wrong sometimes, does not mean Christ get it wrong any of the time. I was tracking him. He's the king of glory. He is worthy of our praise. He has made no errors. He made no mistakes. And so now when you get the opportunity to go and be a witness for him, it's a privilege. It's a privilege. Now, I need y'all to pay close attention. Y'all still with me? Verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Pastors from across the world misteach this passage. We're tracking together. Now, some of y'all know English grammar better than I do. You say, Pastor, we know. We can tell. <laughs> we listen to you, and your grammar is atrocious. <laughs> Smile at me. This word here, the Holy Spirit's come upon you. You will be my Witnesses. What part of speech is witnesses? Okay, it's plural, absolutely. It's a noun. But typically we come to this passage and we treat it like a verb. Why is that significant? Because we get so concerned about doing that we forget being. We are human beings, not human doings. And sometimes we say, well, boy, if I do it, it doesn't matter who I am. We well, don't understand who you are. You don't understand how you should function. But when you understand who you are, it informs how you should function. He says here, and you shall be my witnesses. In other words, first and foremost, God wants you to understand your identity. Witnessing is not something you merely go and do. A witness is who you are. And the question becomes, not if you are a witness, the question becomes, what type of witness are you? The question becomes, are you a good witness or a bad witness, an active witness, an inactive witness, a credible witness or a non? The question becomes, what type of witness are you? A witness, watch this now, is not something I decide to do at Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter because the church got together, made me feel guilty, so I'm going to go out for a few minutes, pass out some flyers, and tell folks about Jesus. 
when you understand who you are, you understand when you wake up in the morning, you're a witness for Christ. When you get in the shower, you're a witness for Christ. When you go to wherever you get breakfast from, you're a witness for Christ. When you go on vacation, you're a witness for Christ. When you go lift weights, you're a witness for Christ. When you go walk in the community, you're a witness for Christ. When you go to work, you're a witness for Christ. When you're in the boardroom, you are, wherever you go, you are a witness for God. The question becomes, what kind of witness are you? Are we tracking together? So are you thinking big for the kingdom of God? For the sake of time, I'm going to cut part of my sermon out. Smile let me. No, I ain't. Let's watch this now. Um, <laughs> God's primary work is trying to reach the world for Christ. God's primary work is trying to reach the world for Christ. We spend most of our time investing our time in things that are perishable, things that will not go to eternity, but we spend a small amount of time investing in things for eternity. Are you thinking big about the kingdom? Here's my thesis for the day. When you understand who you are, then you can unleash who you are. When you understand who you are, then you can unleash who you are. Ephesians 2.10 says you were created unto good works. Many of us are trying to find satisfaction without identifying and unleashing whom God has called us to be. We wonder why the education didn't solve the problem. We wonder why the extra money didn't solve the problem. We wonder why getting out the hospital didn't solve the problem. We wonder why more travel didn't solve the problem. We wonder why better investments didn't solve the problem. Because you didn't solve the problem. The problem is God has created an eternity kingdom-sized void on the inside of your life. And until you submit to whom God has created you to be, you will never be fulfilled because you will not unleash and do what God has made you to be. Are we tracking together? You will find satisfaction when you align yourself with why God has placed you on the planet. Are we tracking together? Don't fall prey to the trap of the American dream. God has uniquely designed you for a special purpose and a special reason. Will you cooperate with God's work? God's presence is powerful. God's presence is distinct from his person. God's person and presence is active in the lives of believers and non-believers. It's a myth to say, well, God don't work in the lives of non-believers. If God didn't work in the lives of non-believers, they would never come to Christ. The Arminian view is, is that, well, we decide we're coming to Christ and we make up our minds. We want to trust Christ and then we go and receive Christ apart from the work of God. That's unscriptural. The Bible says no one could come to him unless he draws them. John 15 says the spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. If the Holy Spirit did not convict us, we would never have a mind to go and serve Christ. And so if Christ didn't work in the mind of non-believers, non-believers would never have enough sense to place their trust in Christ. So it sounds good. Well, you know what? God can't work in no unclean vessel. And, and well, well, if God didn't work in unclean vessels, he wouldn't work in no vessels. Now, the logical next step is not to go, well, I'm just going to be dirty then. That's not what they're saying. <laughs> that's not what they're saying, all right? It's just saying that sometimes God's grace transcends our, 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 our iniquity. In spite of us, God works. Amen? So number one, watch this now. God's presence and God's person is at work in the lives of unbelievers, according to John 16. The Holy Spirit is reproving the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But watch this now. The Holy Spirit is also at work in the lives of believers to be a, to be a message in what they embody and to be a message in what we say. And so watch this now. 
He says, well, well, we will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. And we ought to be engaged in being a, a, a validation of being a proof, of being a testimony, of being a witness of what God can do. Amen. Same way many of us pastors today, boy, are giving a black eye on Christianity and causing folks like my old teammate to have questions about Christianity. That interferes with our testimony, but it does not stop the reality of who Christ is. Amen? So the question becomes, are you going to cooperate with the power and the person of who God is? Are you going to think bigger? And then next we see Satan's work against the work and the worker of God in the world. How you know, boy, Satan is real? John P. Key, I was like, listen, on the way over here, John P. Key said, Jesus is real, I know the. See, but y'all ain't ready. Get ready. Uh -huh. All right. But watch this now. How many of y'all know, boys, Satan is real as well? Satan is real as well. Satan blinds non-believers. And so the reason people are going to don't go look for God is because they're blind. We ought to stop saying, why do sinners sin? Why do drinkers drink? Why do alcoholics drink? Why do dope, um, 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 dope fiends use dope? Why do fornicators fornicate? Why do sinners sin? Sinners sin because they're sinners. Why are we so shocked? They're, doing, they're living out the job description. James 1 says, be not deceived because God cannot be tempted and God will not tempt you with sin. But we are tempted and enticed by our own lust. Are we tracking together? Watch this now. We need to make sure that we understand that Satan is real. And, and what Satan does is he deceives us. He blinds us. And so when people have a moment of san sanity, that's the opportunity for us to share the good news of Jesus Christ and allow his word to woo their hearts, allow his word to turn the lights on, allow his wisdom, allow his Holy Spirit to turn their lives around. Amen? So how can we think bigger? Let me give you four ways to think bigger. I'm not going to belabor these. Number one, we got to be thinking bigger about the expansion of the kingdom. We ought to be thinking bigger about the expansion of the kingdom. How can we cooperate with the expansion of the kingdom of God? How can you use my time? How can you use my talent? How can you use my treasures to expand the kingdom of God? Now, be careful here, right? Because, but watch this now. God is not just calling us to be a social club. God's not calling us just merely to be um, 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 like, um, like, like, like some social group that flies in after a storm. God is calling us to come in and to help change people's eternity, not just change their time. Are we tracking together? God hasn't just called us just to go and just do and just do nice things for people. He's called us to go and expand the kingdom, people knowing who Christ is, and in turn, they make a difference for Christ. Number two. We ought to be thinking bigger about the engagement of the kingdom. See, boy, the expansion of the kingdom. So you know what? I want to help expand the kingdom, but the engagement is, Lord, how do you want to use me in this engagement? I'm going to share with my kids. I'm going to call a family meeting. I'm going to share with my kids. I typed out my family vision years ago, probably decades ago now. Here is my goal for you all. Here is what my vision, because sometimes kids get twisted, don't they? Here's my goal. Here's my plan. Here's my vision. Here's what I desire to do. And then I text my daughter this morning, I want you to know I'm fully committed to whatever God wants to do in your life. I want to engage it. I want to engage it. Are you engaged with the things of the kingdom intentionally? Are you engaged in the things of the kingdom volitionally? Are you engaged in the things of the kingdom sacrificially? See, what happens is we think it's a burden to do kingdom work today. We think it's extra to do kingdom work. We think it's an inconvenience to do kingdom work. Number three, you ought to be thinking bigger 
about, about your spiritual enjoyment. Thinking bigger about your spiritual enjoyment. How many of y'all want joy in your life? How many of y'all want peace in your life? How does song go? Joy, joy, joy. Okay, anyway. I can't, I can't wait to God get my new voice. Uh, come on, I hope with a new body come a new voice. Smile at me. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and we'll close here on today. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is an interesting passage. And so often we think about our accolades and our awards here on earth. But we don't think about our awards and our accolades in eternity. And he comes here and starting in verse 10. And um, he's talking about divisions that exist in the church. And he talks about um, maturity in verses um, 1 through 9. And then he, um, he comes to verse 10 and says this. Let me see. I want to back up. He says in verse 5, what then is, let's start at verse 1. Okay, here we go. <laughs> but our brother's not addressed to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. And so Paul is talking to this extremely gifted church. He said, well, well, man, God can't use ungodly people. Well, he should tell the church of Corinth that. Because people at Corinth, they were extremely ungodly and, and, and wicked and very, very carnal people. But they were still a very gifted people. He says, but brothers, I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. In other words, you guys are not acting as mature, but as infants in Christ. Key words in Christ. Y'all in Christ, okay? I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And you even now, you are not yet ready. They were sucking on pablum, baby food. Verse 3, for you are still of the flesh, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, arguing of the flesh and behaving only in a human way, our disunity is an indication of our immaturity as believers. For when one says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, and are you not um, being merely human? I follow Jakes, I follow Evans, I follow um, um, Stanley, I follow Andy, I follow, you name your person. When you follow them instead of Christ, that's your immaturity. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. God said, I'm the one who assigned these people to you. Verse 6, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. And so right now, we think so much about church growth that we forget, you know what? It's God who gives the growth. It's not just merely human ingenuity. It's God who gives the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his wages according to his labor. Y'all with me? In other words, you will receive according to your labor. The thing is, though, you don't receive salvation based upon your labor. You receive rewards based upon your labor. Look at me online. Smile at me. Too many of us think there's just going to be one award. God ain't living in 2024. Everybody don't get the same trophy. <laughs> Kid didn't play a lick. Come on, get, come on, get, come on, get, get my trophy, right? Take your pictures. Y'all posted them online. They didn't play a minute. Smile at me. Watch this now. There will be varying degrees of rewards in heaven based upon your investment, your sacrifice for God on earth. Amen? So we will not all, we will all enjoy heaven, but we will not all enjoy heaven equally. Y'all all right? For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. I'll come back upon that next week. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on a foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. Each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one of us has done. So the question becomes, 
by your efforts and by your works? Are you producing works that will be burned up when it comes time to test it? Are you producing something that can stand the test of time? Wood, hay, and stubble, King James says, straw will burn. Gold, silver, and precious stones, they may experience the heat, but they will endure the fire. He's not talking about salvation. He's talking about rewards. Verse 14, if the, wor if, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Are you thinking bigger about your spiritual enjoyment? Are you thinking bigger about what kind of rewards will God give me in heaven? Now, there's another myth that goes around that says, well, if, you, if you're doing it to get something out of it, you shouldn't do it. Where is that in the Bible? He just told you that, boy, you're going to have two types of work, those that can't stand the fire and those that cannot stand the fire. The logic is I want to make sure I'm doing stuff for the right reason, for the right purpose, so that, boy, I can have um, precious metal rewards when I get to heaven. Watch this now. Rewards is not the most mature motivator, but it is a motivator none the less. The next month or so, it's going to be graduation season. People are going to be graduating. They're going to be celebrating. And for many people, when it comes to graduation, they just, you know what, I'm just trying to get to the end. I can't wait till I leave this place. Whether it's kindergarten, <laughs> sixth grade, twelfth grade, college, master's degree, PA. I'm just trying to get out of here. Amen? But then when you get to graduation, there's an interesting thing that happens. Most people spoke, you know what, I just want to get to graduation. As long as I get my degree, my degree, I'll be satisfied. Any way you bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. But then you're sitting there, but you get this program. And the program is in different colors based upon where you go, different qualities of paper, different configurations, but basically it's the same thing on the inside. It's you're going to be here for a long time. But while you're sitting there, you might as well have some reading. So we're going to tell you who the president is and boy, who the provost is. Folks, you may never heard of before in your life. We're going to tell you who's going to be speaking and where they're from and all that kind of stuff. We're going to tell you the different colleges that have been acknowledged. There. Because, boy, some schools are so large, they don't graduate. Everybody say, well, here are the colleges who are graduating today. Then at some point, you see a list of names. And that's where you're going to look for your loved one's name. And you start going on the program and you're waiting for everything to start. And so I can find my loved one's name, the person I'm here for. And so I can find their name. And then at some point in the program, you learn everybody doesn't get the same level of degree. They have this thing called magna cum laude. They have this thing called summa cum laude. And then the rest of us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Lord, amen. Now, I'm just glad I got in. I'm glad I got in. But how would it have changed the assignment you turned in? And the effort you invested, if you were consistently conscious and cognizant of magna cum laude, summa cum laude, and thank you, laude. <laughs> I tell my kids to go to college. You never know what you're going to do after undergraduate. So make sure you get at least a 3.5. So if you get at least 3.5, you can get in somebody's MBA program and somebody's graduate program somewhere after you finish this. So just in case 
God leads you. Get at least a 3.5 GPA. Some of y'all say, Pastor, I was thinking, Lord. Uh, <laughs> in other words, I want you thinking about something greater later than just merely surviving. You all know that God's going to issue out rewards for your investment of your time, your talent, and your treasure for the kingdom of God. When you get to heaven, will you be summa cum laude? Magna cum laude? Or just thank you, Lord? I couldn't do magna cum laude here on earth. My wife could. She's bright. But I'm aiming for it for glory. I want to be magna cum laude. We want to invite you guys to invest during this season. Do you recognize that people really are perishing and going to hell without Christ? You got friends, you got family members, you got folks you work with who are headed toward a crisis eternity. And Satan has got us so busy. We really don't care. It's not, it's not that we, we, we don't care. We just don't think about it. I've got one of my buddies from high school who came down to visit this year for a funeral. We got together. And we talked about everything over at Papa Do's. We talked about everything. And I was so happy to think about it. I hadn't seen him in years. But this is one of my old road dogs. We'd be out late together. We can't tell y'all about it. <laughs> he was a big old burly football player, a big old tall basketball player. And we came up in the Papa Do's and we saw one another. And in the middle of the Papa Do's, you got two big old black brothers hugging each other. And I was like, what up with that? <laughs> Just happy to see each other. And we sat there, we talked about two hours, and we reminisced and all that kind of stuff. And I got home. Well, he knows what I do and all that kind of stuff. And I got home. Holy Spirit convicted me. You didn't talk that much about eternity with him. You talked about time. But you didn't spend that much time talking to eternity with him. So I text him. I say, when's a good time to call you? I got something very important to discuss with you. He said, he said you can call anytime. I said, what about right now? He said, no, not right now. <laughs> yeah, we schedule the time to talk. I don't want to see my boy go to hell. I don't want to see my boy not go to heaven. Our world has us so focused on what happens here. But we all be concerned about the Palestinians and what's happening in Gaza right now. Over 32,000 lives have been snuffed out. Do you recognize there's more than 32,000 people who go into a crisis eternity? Are we just as moved by the people who are going to a crisis eternity as we appropriately are about the people in Palestine? who've been moved from their homes, moved from their comfort zone, moved from their jobs. Do we care? So I want to ask you guys to engage with us during this season. Amen? And we come to a busy time of the year, and the first part, I'm through preaching, I'm pastoring now. The first part is talking about Easter. It's a built-in opportunity online and in person to go and be politically incorrect and talk with people about Christ and who he is and what difference he makes. So we've created some tools for you guys to go out there and do that. This is what the my idea I, initially. I got it from my pastor, his church. <laughs> they gave people text messages that they can copy and paste and send to their friends. Will y'all pull your phones out right now, please? 
And when you go into your text area, I know y'all been texting already. Take it off the news and the sports you've been watching during the sermon. <laughs> Take it to the text page. And I, I think they're going to put an opportunity for a message on the screen. And I want you all to copy that. If you can't get there, go to discoverdestiny.org backslash witness. Discoverdestiny.org backslash witness. And there'll be some message where you can download there and you can copy and paste that. And I want to ask you all to invite some friends. I want you all to invite people you hadn't seen in church for a long time. Amen. I want you to invite people you don't even like. You know, I would invite you to God can save you and change your attitude. Smile at me. Well, we got a lot of stuff going on for kids as well. There should be some information about what's going to be happening with the kids, with the adults, and by people who got kids and adults. You guys, it's just not about going to church. It's about winning people who are facing a crisis eternity and then helping develop them in Christ. Amen? So, Father, we come to you now, Lord Jesus. The song says, come, Holy Spirit, come. Peter says, God, that the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. But God, you are giving people time to repent. And so, Father, may we be empowered to go out and be a witness, to live a life that says, you know what, Christ is real, but also, God, to give a verbal witness of who you are and what you can do, Father. So we pray, God, that we can do that. And pray, God, that we would engage. In the past, they got it says, some plant, some water, but it's you who give the increase. If a person is hit two, three, four, five times, it don't matter, God, it might be planting the seeds in some lives, or maybe be watering others on the other side. I pray, God, we can do our part. In Jesus' name, I pray ask it all. Amen.